hospitals, a hospital full of diseases, a prison crowded with malefactors and debtors, a field of battle strewed with carcasses, a fleet foundering on the ocean, a nation languishing under tyranny, famine, or pestilence. I mean, something's wrong. Unless your eyes are closed, unless you've had a peculiarly easy life, something is wrong. A world of terrorism, um, a world in London anyway of teenagers being stabbed almost every week um, by gangs of other teenagers. Um, A world of Brexit, a world of distrust, a world of broken relationships. Something is, is wrong. At least I hope you think something is wrong. One of the problems about atheism, and I'll say more about this tomorrow night if you're able to join us. One of the problems about atheism is saying something is wrong doesn't really make sense because something just is. I mean, this came about by chance. We're the product of accidents. Uh, All we are is atoms and all our emotions are is atoms. So sure, I might feel sad, but sad is just the decrease in the concentration of serotonin in my brain. And if you upped my chemical levels, I'd feel happy. And anyway, who cares about what I feel? Because all I am as a person is an impersonal collection of atoms. And good and evil are just arbitrary labels that we give to states of atoms that came about by chance. Uh, Richard Dawkins, everyone's favorite atheist, he, he gets this and puts it very starkly. He says, in a universe of electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces and genetic replication. Some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Um, The labels good and evil don't make sense if they're just arbitrary descriptions of random numbers. And I don't think that's a very plausible philosophy in the face of terrorism and stabbing and broken relationships and pain. I think most of us accept there is something wrong. That's not controversial. But the teaching of Jesus about what is wrong is very, very surprising. And it's very shocking and it's very unsettling. But ultimately, I think it gives us great hope. And I want to do today what we did yesterday, which is to look at some of the teaching of Jesus firsthand. Um, I think when I was at school, I was pretty ignorant about Christianity. And I'd more or less made up my mind about Jesus from a couple of dodgy Channel 4 documentaries shown at Easter and my first year RE lessons. And I'd never, as a teenager, engaged firsthand with any of the historical evidence about Jesus. And that's what we want to do this week. Every day, I'll be opening the page of Mark's Gospel, uh, these books on your, on your tables. Maybe you could just grab one of them now. This is, um, or about half of it anyway, there's a study guide at the back, but about half of this is an English translation of a first century Greek text written by somebody who was a, a close friend of Peter, who was one of Jesus' 12 followers. So we're, we've got a source right next to the events, written at the same time as Jesus, by somebody who knew Uh, the Apostle Peter, very, very well. And I want us to engage with this. Yesterday, we looked a little bit about why we should trust this document historically. I'm not going to go over the same ground now, but if you want to ask me afterwards, please do. But for now, let's just take this as as some kind of accurate um, portrayal of Jesus by people who knew him. And I want you to look at his teaching about what is wrong with the world. And you'll find it on page 32. Maybe you can turn there now. Page 32 and halfway down the the page, chapter 7. I'm going to read the whole section and then make some comments on it. The Pharisees and some teachers of the law who'd come from Jerusalem gathered round Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. 
So the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it's written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commandments of God and are holding on to human traditions. He continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down and you do many things like this. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me everyone and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he said? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile him? It doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Okay, so the background is Jesus is turning out to be quite unpopular with religious people. Maybe that's a surprise to you. You thought religious people would love Jesus and um, it's other people who have a problem with him. Actually, it was the opposite. When Jesus walked the earth, religious people, by and large, hated him. And ordinary people loved him. And the controversy he got into with the religious people is that his disciples aren't observing all of their special religious rules. And they have this whole practice that you were supposed to wash everything, not just wash your hands for hygiene reasons, but in a kind of ceremonially religious way, there was all these washings to go through. And Jesus' disciples ignore this, and a, and a huge controversy breaks. And in the context of that controversy, Jesus says, you know, the problem of uncleanness, the problem of defilement, the problem of evil isn't outside in, it's inside out. So look again at that last little statement of Jesus, the bottom of page 34, final paragraph. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. It is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil things come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, etc. I think the fact that these things are evil, I think, I think that's not difficult to agree on, is it? A malice, malice is wanting harm to come on somebody else because you don't like them. That's not a very nice thing in society. I think most of us agree with that. Slander, you know, when you diss somebody else just because they're not in the room, but then when you leave the room, the other people in the room diss you. You all know how it works. You know, it's always the person who's not there that's slandered. And we're naive if we think that it doesn't happen when we're not there. It's not a very nice thing, is it, to be spoken about behind your back. When you accidentally overhear something said about yourself, that is cruel. But that, that's not very nice. Most people don't like that. Arrogance. Um, I think I was quite arrogant as a teenager, but I didn't enjoy being arrogant. I felt ashamed if I was caught out in my arrogance. Not a very nice thing. It's a given. You don't have to be a Christian to think that those things are bad. But the, the bombshell that Jesus drops is he says these things come from inside us. They come from out of our hearts because there is something that is wrong even in our hearts. There's a man called Jeffrey Handley Taylor who was um, a scholar in 1952 and he compiled an analysis of 200 
traditional nursery rhymes. And in the nursery rhymes that Geoffrey Handley Taylor analysed, he found, and I quote, eight allusions to murder, unclassified, two cases of choking to death, one case of death by devouring, one case of cutting a human being in half, one case of death by squeezing, one case of death by shriveling, one case of boiling to death, seven cases relating to the severing of limbs, one case of the desire to have a limb severed, eight cases of whipping and lashing, 14 cases of stealing and general dishonesty, one allusion to marriage as a form of death, um, nine allusions to poverty and want, two cases of unlawful imprisonment, two cases of racial discrimination. And Mr. Henry Taylor was scandalized that such unsavory elements, as he described them, should be found in literature designed for innocent children. And he joined others in calling back in the 1950s for nursery rhyme reform. It's the same logic behind PG certificates on films or um, internet search filters for kids. The idea is if I can keep the bad stuff out, then the children will grow up innocent and sweet and will be able to sort out society. And Jesus says, no, unfortunately not. It's not like we're innocent until we turn on the internet. Uh, we're not innocent until we read about Hansel and Gretel baking somebody in an oven. Uh, no, the malice and the deceit and the arrogance and the foolishness is already there inside us. And that's a terrible thing to realize. But it's particularly terrible because it means that we can't fix it. As a society, I think we know there's something wrong, don't we? Um, child abuse, broken relationships, suicide, highest at Bristol University, anywhere in the country, everybody knows that. Something's wrong. We know there's a problem that needs to be fixed. But in our society, we combine the problem with an amazing self-confidence. Um, I want to allude now to a children's TV program that I think was prime time in your youth, just judging by our age difference. And I'll just test it in this way. Bob the Builder. Bob the Builder. Well, there, there is an example of global brainwashing. Everyone... Uh, has been drilled by the BBC. And I think that is, I mean, it's a fun TV programme, but that is our philosophy of life, isn't, isn't it? Yeah, sure, something might be wrong. I get, I mean, even in my own life, if I'm honest, there's things that I'm not that satisfied with. There are things that I probably wouldn't want other people in this room to know about me. Things I'm ashamed of. Things I regret. But I'll fix it. You know, I can, I can get through this. I, I can sort myself out. I can, Im, I can improve. One of the things I used to have on my conscience as a student was the way I treated my mum. My, my mum was um, a wonderful lady and was um, unfailingly loving to me in my, in my upbringing. And I think because she was so loving, I could take advantage of her. And I could treat her badly and she'd take it. And so I did. And it made me feel bad. And I was ashamed of myself and I wanted to do better. And so we come up with various solutions to fix ourselves. And Jesus says the trouble is the problem's already there on the inside. Well, one of the things people try to fix it is, is religion. So what if I could do something externally to myself just to sort of scrub myself up? What, what if I were to wash obsessively? You know, what if I were to wash before I ate? What if I were to be careful what kinds of food I had? This is a, a first century Jewish version. It's called kosher, but we get 21st century faddish health versions, don't we? Like I'll only eat kia seeds and avocados or whatever. I'll be a vegan. I'll go through a detox. Maybe if I control what comes into my body, I can sort out my body. And Jesus says, no, no. Do, do you not remember the diagram on your GCSE biology classroom wall of the digestive system and it went a bit like this mouth esophagus stomach small intestine large intestine rectum loo and the heart isn't in that pathway so jesus says look don't you see that nothing 
Going into person from the outside can defile them, verse 18, bottom of page 34. It doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and out of their body. See, it's not, you can't suddenly be contaminated by the wrong kind of food or by accidentally not washing enough. You can't be contaminated thereby, but you also can't be decontaminated by that because the problem's already in the inside. If the problem's in your heart and all you do is wash your food and your hands, you're not going to fix it. It's already there. And this is a real bombshell because Jesus is basically saying your religion is worthless. All you're managing to do at best is to clean up the outside of you. So you have people who look on the outside really sorted and on the inside they're really rotten. And there's a word for that and it's the word hypocrite. Hypocrite. That's what Jesus calls them. You know, you religious people, you're all about just looking great on the outside. You go to the temple on Saturday, you go to church on Sunday, uh, you go to Mecca once a lifetime. But on the inside, the problem's still there. Still malicious, still slandering others, still arrogant. Bob the Builder, you can't fix this. That is a devastating diagnosis, I think, of human beings. And you might listen to Jesus and you might disagree with him strongly. There's various ways you could disagree. You could say, Jesus, I don't think evil exists. I think we're just random. I think that good and evil are really the same. Um, I don't think it matters if a teenager gets stabbed. All they're doing is rearranging atoms that were there randomly in the first place. I hope there's nobody there with that kind of bleak philosophy. Or you might disagree with Jesus, and I think this is more likely. You might disagree with Jesus saying, no, I, Jesus, I agree with you, something is wrong. Our society is not where it should be. But trust me, Jesus, it's just going to get better. I mean, it hasn't got better for 2,000 years. I mean, increasing technology has just increased ways of hurting each other and killing people. And I know the statistics are against us because the suicide rates are up and the Levels of child abuse are up and the stabbings in London are up. But trust us, we, we can fix it somehow in the face of the evidence. Or you can say, and this is, I think, what we should say, but it's frightening. We could say, Jesus, you're right, there is a problem and we can't fix it. It's a terrifying thing to admit, isn't it? Because where do we go then? I mean, is that just despair? Well, no, because wonderfully, Jesus, as well as giving this diagnosis, he also has... Incredible medicine. Just turn to page six. Bottom of page six. A man with leprosy came to Jesus and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now what do you do for leprosy in the first century? You can't wash it away. You haven't got the antifungals or antibiotics or antivirals, whatever it is, to deal with it. What can you do? Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell anyone this, but go and show yourself to the priest And offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly. He became so famous, but he stayed outside in lonely places. This is amazing, isn't it? A man with leprosy. Because you know how contamination works. You don't take somebody with tuberculosis and then put them in a bed in a hospital next to somebody who's got um, clean lungs um, and they won't get better. No, the person with clean lungs will get tuberculosis. Or you don't take somebody, you don't take a um, a rotten apple and then put it in a fruit bowl with all your good fruit and expect it to turn good. No, the, the other fruit will turn bad. You get someone with leprosy and you touch them if you've got healthy skin. They're not going to suddenly get better. They're not going to catch your healthy skin, you are going to catch their leprosy. You know, you might do the biological maths, clean plus unclean equals unclean. But Jesus touches this man and clean plus unclean equals clean. 
let me say that is very, very unusual. Uh, there's even this reference to Moses about um, 1,000, 1,400 years before Jesus. A guy called Moses, writing in the Jewish scriptures, had described what to do in the case of someone being cleansed of leprosy. And it's in the priestly manual, and all the Jewish priests know about this. It's in a book called Leviticus, chapter 13 and 14. And I like to imagine that God put this in there just to tease the priest for 1,400 years, waiting for this day. You know, they've all got to learn it at their priest college, but no one has ever had to use it. This is what to do in the case that somebody gets better from leprosy. They, ne they never do. And then this guy turns up and... I'm here about the leprosy, you know, and they're like, leprosy, you know, get back. No, 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 I, I used to have it, I, I don't anymore. How, how come, can, can you explain this, this cure? What did you do? Did you, you know, was it the, the washings or the, the ritual? Oh, no, 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 Jesus touched you. He touched you. Yeah, Jesus extraordinarily has the ability to turn the unclean clean. Over the page, next paragraph, Jesus meets a man and says to him, you are forgiven. Amazing thing to be able to say. If Jesus really means it, if he really can sort out somebody on the inside, forgiven. Precious thing. Over the page again, top of page 10. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, Many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for many of them followed Jesus. Tax collectors, by the way, they weren't the upstanding members of the Inland Revenue that we love. That, uh, remember, Israel was an occupied country, occupied by Roman soldiers. Tax collectors were Jews who worked for the occupation, taxing their own people and giving it to the enemy. People despised them. And they loved Jesus, these outcasts. Uh, sinners, prostitutes, they loved Jesus. And the religious people, they were scandalized. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw Jesus eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? What is he doing hanging out with these kinds of people? People in the moral gutter. And Jesus heard it and said to them, oh, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I haven't come to call the righteous, but sinners. I used to think that the world was divided into good people and bad people. And when I first heard the Christian message in Cambridge as an undergraduate, I remember a talk at a church I went to that was designed for the kids. And sometimes it's the kids' talks that may stick in your mind. And the, the minister said, we divide people into two halves, good people and bad people. Jesus divides people into two halves. Bad people who think they're good and bad people who know they're bad. And I wonder which kind you are today. Bad people who think they're good. Jesus' word for that is, you're a hypocrite. Maybe lots of religious people fall into that trap. They certainly did in Jesus' day. They, they cleaned up the outside, you see. And so they thought they were better than everyone else. And Jesus says, your hearts are just as far away from God as everyone else. Or, today, this lunchtime, are you a bad person who knows you're bad? You accept the diagnosis. You say to Jesus, you're right, I have got a problem. Some of the evil things in my life, they came from inside me. I don't like what's there inside. And I can't fix it. And Jesus says, I can fix it. I can make the unclean clean. I can forgive. I'm the sin doctor. Come for those who are ill morally. Um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I'd love to talk to you more. Please take these away, by the way. We've looked at just a couple of pages. I hope you'll agree it's more interesting than you might have expected. Please take it away and read more, but otherwise, more of this uh, tomorrow. Thanks very much.